guys, welcome back to my channel for a late but not too late Garbagist recap. Sorry, I've been MIA. I was gone for a month. Um, uh, life, I just, I got a new job, I got a new schedule, I had some getting used to it and whatever. I just wanted to start this video before getting into the Garbagist recap part. I recently got a shout out by Michael K. Vaughn on his channel and so first I wanted to thank you so much for shouting me out. I really appreciate it and so a lot of you I think are new from his channel and so hi welcome my name is Celeste and I mainly do horror and horror related stuff even though sometimes I venture into other genres for the most part, stay creepy though. I mean, weirdo is in the title of the channel, so that's typically what we're going for. Anyway, so welcome. If you're new, welcome back if you're not. And yeah, I hope we'll have a lot of fun. So in August leading up to week four, I read Philosophy in the Boudoir by Marquis de Sade. Um, I read Venus in First by Leopold von sacker -Masek. And Ways to Ruin a Royal Reputation by Danny Collins. Um, so if you want to hear about these, I'll link the playlist for my Garbagus below. By the way, in my um, Waste to Ruin a Royal Reputation video, I did an out of context quotes segment at the end. Stay tuned for today's segment at the end because it's pretty weird. I mean, so week four was what the fuck trash that made you rethink your life. And boy was this one a doozy. <laughs> So one thing I did in preparation for Garbagus was ask friends for recommendations and it turns out that for this one I asked a friend of mine who happens to be in his third year, maybe fourth, of literature and archaeology school. <laughs> Asking friends who are studying literature for reading advice on a very what the fuck book may have been the best thing I've ever done and also the <laughs> most dangerous thing I've ever done. Let me give you a little bit of context into this book before I tell you what it's about because quite frankly I don't even know what it's about. I read the whole damn thing and I don't know what it's about. So here's a little bit of background on the Comte de l'Autremont. So the Comte de l'Autremont, Comte is French for Count, Count of l'Autremont. Um, Comte de l'Autremont was the pseudonym for Isidore Lucas Ducas. So right there we have the bingo card check for a pseudonym, um, who was a Uruguayan-born French poet. Little is known about his life as he wished to leave no memoirs. He died at the age of 24 in Paris. First of all, 24, I'm like, his only works, Les Chants de Mal d'Aurore and Poésie, or poems, um, had a major influence on modern literature, particularly in the Surrealists, um, similarly to Baudelaire and Rimbaud, who are other French poets which are who are amazing, and the Situationalists, which I didn't even know was a movement. Comte de Tremont is one of the poets maudits and a precursor to Surrealism. So, poets maudits, which I was going to make a whole video on them in October. Poète Maudit is French for the Cursed Poets, which is a group of poets such as Gondre Trémont, Baudelaire, Rambeau, and others, which, who were like, wrote like very dark poetry and like, yeah, I'll refer to my video on them that's going to come out in October. <laughs> But yeah, it's a whole vibe. It's a whole vibe. Okay, so at this point you may be wondering, Celeste, what is this book about? So essentially, um, no one really knows what the book is about because it's about every, it's very stream of consciousness, the way it's written. Um, the concept of this book is that it's the songs of Maldor in that there are many songs, not songs like modern songs, but like it's kind of like prose poetry format. Um, that kind of tell different stories of Maldor. Um, so Maldor is um, like pure evil. He, you know, it, it's a person or like an entity like in the shape of a human type of thing who is pure evil. He's like the archangel, like embodiment of pure evil on earth basically. 
And so the songs tell stories of him and philosophical reflections on his actions and it's very interesting because you get first person, third, um, third person, second person, and you also get parts where the author, I can't remember what it's called, but you know when the author's voice kind of stands out from the book and comments on the actual story, but it's not a narrator, it's the author talk? I can't, what? Can someone remind us all what this is called when it happens? But it's very cool. And sometimes you get first person of Maldor talking about how he feels on about humanity. Sometimes you get people talking about Maldor and like telling his story. And um, I think the best way to explain what kind of stuff happens in this book is to tell you a short snippet of what happens. <laughs> because it's very much like it's like telling a story of like random moments of life and then connecting them with a philosophical train of thought, but it's everything is out of context. Before I filmed this video, I had to Google what is the Songs of Maldor about? Because I finished reading it and I'm like, I don't know what to say. I do not know what to say. First of all, I found articles about how to prepare students for the baccalauréat, which is the exam that students have to take in France at the end of 12th grade. And I'm like, we're teaching this to kids in school at the end of like in high school. <sighs> Welcome to France. Like, I'm not surprised, but maybe you'll be out. <laughs> anyway, and so then I find like almost every single website is like, we don't know what this is about. Scholars don't know what this is about. Um, it's kind of a book. <laughs> so yeah, here's kind of one of the many things that happens in this book. Um, trigger warning for everything. Um, so one of the things that happens in this book. Okay, cue a scene where this man is walking down the street and he sees this crazy woman or like a woman who's lost her mind and she's just walking around in the streets of Paris and he's like just watch he's people watching and he's seeing her and he sees children throwing like stuff at her paper or whatever just throwing stuff at her and so he's observing this scene and he's like oh my goodness this reminds me of this time <laughs> This or this like crazy or this, you know, making fun of or this crazy, whatever. This scene reminds me in one way or another of this time where I came across Meldor in my life or how Meldor affected my life. And so then he t starts going into a flashback and talking about um, how Meldor murdered his daughter. <laughs> and so he's like, what happened was that his daughter was sleeping, like 10 year old or like child type, right? Sleeping under the tree, this random tree. Um, he says the name of the tree and it's somehow significant, but I can't remember. And he, she's sleeping under the tree, um, peacefully in the shade, whatever. And then Maldor comes along and he's walking this pit bull and he sees this little girl and he decides, okay, I'm going to rape her <laughs> because some reason I can't remember, but he decides I'm going to rape this little girl. And so he does and he assaults her and then he st st stands aside and then he tells his pit bull to assault the little girl. But by the time the pit bull is doing it, the little girl is kind of like out of her free, like flight, fight or flight situation, but she was freezing. And so now she's like screaming for help as the dog is there. And so then Meldor gets mad that she's screaming for help. And so he kicks the dog and the dog runs away and he mutilates her. Like he takes a knife and mutilates the girl from her vagina upwards and pulls out all of her organs and everything and then she like dies obviously and um then she 
<laughs> leaves her under the tree and takes note of how she's peacefully sleeping under this tree and what a beautiful sight. And then the, <laughs> here's the really messed up part, okay? Um, then, so the narr the, the author, like I told you earlier, the author takes a step back and there's this kind of like philosophical reflection on, um, and what just happened and then at the very end the author takes a step back and says oh this man who was watching this crazy woman will never sleep under the shadow of a tree he'll never walk a pit bull he'll never get a pit bull and he'll forever wander the streets as if he were a crazy woman getting thrown stuff <laughs> getting stuff thrown at him by little children and I'm just like and that's one of the nicer, that's one of the most, um, I don't want to say nicer, but the one of the most understandable things that happens in this book. I mean understandable not as in I understand how this could happen. I mean understandable as in the most concrete chain of events because like I said this is a very abstract type of book. You know what I mean? So it's very what the fuck y'all it'll throw you into some type of spiral guarantee that's a bug bound guarantee right there okay speaking of spiraling who's ready for out of context quotes i know i am okay i translated some out of context quotes for you guys because we love out of context quotes here the whole book is out of context out of context in and of itself i hope you enjoy these out of context quotes yeah. <laughs> I, like the dogs, feel a need for the infinite. I cannot, I cannot satisfy this need. I'm the son of man and woman, so I am told. It surprises me. I thought I was more. The grand universal family of humans is a utopia worthy of the most mediocre logic. How do you expect, stranger? For the pickaxe to move this earth, which first nourishes us, and then gives us a comfortable bed preserved from the wind that winter blows furiously in the cold regions, when the one who holds the pickaxe with his trembling hands after all day convulsively poked at the cheeks of the dead, who returned to his kingdom, sees in the evening before him, written in letters of flame, on each wooden cross, a statement of the frightening problem which humanity has not yet resolved. The mortality or immortality of the soul. With the help of this terrible auxiliary I discovered in humanity, swimming towards the shadows, facing the reef of hatred, its black and hideous wickedness, which stagnated in the midst of deleterious miasmas admiring its own navel. Conscious severely judges our most secret thoughts and acts, and is not mistaken. As she is often powerless to prevent evil, she keeps stalking men like a fox, especially during the dark. My anus was intercepted by a crab. Encouraged by my inertia, it guards the entrance with his claws, and hurts me a lot. Goodbye. I'm off to brave the breeze of the cliffs. For my half suffocated lungs are crying out for a quieter, more virtuous spectacle than that of yourself. Oh, if instead of being a hell, the universe had only been an immense celestial anus. Look at the gesture that I make on the side of my lower abdomen. Yes, I would have pushed my penis through its bloody sphincter, shattering by my impetuous movements the very walls of her pelvis. I swear, dead French poets have a thing for me. <laughs> okay, I made a video a while ago called, like, recommending French literature, and in, I think I was like, oh, Hambu is the only poet who, like, used my name to compare, like, as an adjective about an anus. I cannot tell you how many times in this book, The Songs of Maldor, my name is used as an adjective for either an anus or anything else sexual. I mean, this, I'm, <laughs> floored. Um, there's an expression in French that goes 
So I toyed a coup, which literally means it tore a hole in my butt. <laughs> and the amount of times that my name is used to describe an anus tore a hole in my butt. <laughs> For real. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that you may or may not consider picking up the songs of Meldor. Let me know how you feel about it below. <laughs> if you've ever heard about it. Um, yeah, I'll be back later today with my October reading plans and a fun read along project maybe you might want to consider being a part of. Who knows? We'll see. Bye!